Hello and welcome. This is the second episode of Violin Chats. Thanks for tuning in live from wherever you are in the world. And if you're watching the replay, thanks so much for watching. My name is Lynn Kuo, and for those of you who don't know who I am, I play as Assistant Concertmaster in the National Ballet of Canada Orchestra in Toronto. And I was also visiting assistant professor at Memorial University hey, nice. of Newfoundland. My name is oh, I got an echo back here. Excuse me. Uh, I was assistant professor of violin at Memorial University of Newfoundland uh, here in beautiful St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. I hope it's a beautiful day on Saturday, June 20th. And whenever you are watching the replay, I still hope it's a beautiful day. This is really exciting because last uh, Monday, I had my first guest, uh, Nathan Cole. And Nathan was um, a great interviewer, interviewee. He had a great number of stories to share. I hope you catch it on Facebook and YouTube. You can still watch the replay. And I obviously think you're going to be watching the replay for this one as well, if you're not catching it live. And don't forget that I have another violin chat coming up on Monday, June 22nd. And this is all going to be about the violinist life in a quartet. This is going to be with Dr. Min Jung Ko. So if you are not already following my social media accounts or subscribe to my YouTube channel, please do so. And there is a link in the description box to sign up for the mailing list where you will get the first notifications of who will be my future guests. Yes, I do have upcoming guests who are going to be announced later on. And it's going to be very, very useful and very, very interesting. So I also want to point out that my summer violin boot camp is coming in a week. It's very exciting times. We're going to launch very soon and there is still time to enroll if you haven't already. There are very, very few spots left. So just a heads up if you want to get in on the action and partake in the wisdom and knowledge of my guests, such as today's guests, get in touch with me through the social media links and also in the description box. There are definitely links for you to check out. And also check out my social media because today I just announced a giveaway contest. You can win the chance for a bursary for my bootcamp. Okay, so Please, whoever, wherever you are, please drop a line in the comments to say hello. Please say hello, Lynn. Where are you watching from? That would be so fun to read. And for us to know what your name is, you might have to go in and give StreamYard permission. Otherwise, you will show up as an anonymous user. So if you'd like for me to see your name, please go ahead right now and give StreamYard permission. Okay, now with all of that housekeeping out of the way, I know you're here and eager to listen to my esteemed guest for today. She is a violinist and she happens to be five minutes away from me here in St. John's, Newfoundland. And she's joining me today to talk about how we prevent pain and injury and how we can improve our body use for the instruments that we are playing, whether we're a singer or we're an instrumentalist. She has been a, a, a guest on the podcast, Bulletproof Musician. She has been a frequent guest and teacher at the conference of the American String Teachers Association. She has published two books that have, have been published in English, French, and Japanese, What Every Violinist Needs to Know About the Body, and also Teaching Body Mapping to Children. Uh, she has been a founding member of the Atlantic String Quartet here in Newfoundland, she is an incredible resource and I have been plugging her book constantly on my social media. And it is such an honor to have her here as my guest today. She is donating this hour for us so that we can all learn from her journey, her wisdom and her research. Please welcome my guest, Jennifer Johnson. Hi, Jennifer. Hello, Lynn. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's funny that we're talking this way because you're just five minutes. I could hop in my car and see you, see a skeleton. <laughs> Scully, right? His name is Scully? Scully, yeah. Scully. yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I know I've had some really great lessons from you and I, my technique has been totally transformed from you. I think it's really important for us to tell our viewers um, what is body mapping? Could you please tell us what it is and how it's changed you or playing and those that of your students? And your clients? 
Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was started um, back in the kind of the kind of discovered in the late eighties and early nineties um, by Barbara and Bill Conable. And um, Bill Conable was the musician of the two of them. They were a married couple. They're both Alexander Technique teachers. Um, Barbara was the one who really took it and ran with it. Um, through the 90s, she wrote several books. The first one, which I recommend to everybody, is called How to Learn the Alexander Technique. But the how of it is actually by remapping. So that was kind of the beginning of her writing about body mapping. Um, and then she started a, a series called um, What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body. So she wrote a book by that title. And she started a full six-hour course. Um, and along with that came a foundation that she began, a you know organization called, um, well, she called it Andover Educators. We recently changed our name. If you're going looking for us online now, we are now called the Association of Body Mapping Education. And um, so that, that all happened, you know, in a span of I don't know, maybe eight to ten years through kind of the '90s. Um, the reason it all came about was because she and Bill, who were he was teaching, of course cello and chamber music where they were at that time in Columbus, Ohio, but they were also both teaching Alexander Technique. And they were just seeing this incredibly high rate of injury in musicians in particular. She was also working with actors and dancers, and of course we expect there to be injuries for dancers, but uh, it started to really take them by surprise how much injury they were seeing in musicians. And um, the, the penny really dropped for them both, the day Bill was coaching some chamber music at his school, and um, the violinist he was working with had just a very stiff forearm, and he'd already given her some Alexander Technique lessons to try to help with it, and her her teacher had tried to help her free up her bow arm. And um, he was watching her play in this coaching that day, and he, it, he just suddenly realized that, the, you know, it just didn't look like she was trying to move it from where the elbow joint actually was. So that was his first question to her was when they stopped playing and he was going to work on her movement a bit. He said, so show me where, where do you think your elbow is moving from? Where is that bending movement happening? And she ended up pointing about, you know, an inch or so above where the joint actually is. So he thought to himself, well, that's really strange, but let's follow up. So he, he pulled up his arm model something like this one probably. And he showed her exactly where that bending joint is. He explained to her, you know, he showed it from all angles. He showed her where it was on herself. And so then he, he had her find it with her own fingers. We do a lot of this in body mapping. It's called palpating, where we actually just, you know, research our body with our own fingers, basically. And so she had her trace where that joint is and he had her start moving that way. And then after a few moments of doing that, she said, oh, well, that's easy. I can do that. And, and so it just like, it just something hadn't connected for her, probably something in the pedagogy. A teacher at some point had said something to her that it just went a little bit wrong. And her brain started firing in a way uh, to make her believe that the joint, you know, subconsciously we're talking here, but that she felt like the movement was supposed to come from somewhere else. And as soon as we start moving in ways like that, Barbara used to call that a fantasy joint. If you have anything fantasy in your body that isn't actually aligned with the true design, then in order to try to make that happen or come true, you end up using a whole lot of unnecessary muscular work. And that's what we, you know, traditionally call tension or, um, you know, and that's where also where injury comes from after years and years of playing with unnecessary tension. We're, we're putting strains in our body. We're kind of getting a tug of war going on sometimes between different muscle groups. So he came home and they explored that. And she realized that it was this whole realm of information that we could uncover for musicians. And, and that's, so that was the beginning of it. And um, she has since retired, but um, we are, there are five of us now who are doing the training for our association in English we have one person training in, in Japan. And, um, so, you know, the organization is growing and growing, and we're just trying to help people really understand how to remap. We call it remapping. If, you know, we give somebody a new piece of information, they go, oh, that's not how I thought my body worked in that spot. And 
they we give them some movement explorations or um, you know just show them how to apply it at their instrument they hear a different sound come out all of a sudden because which always surprises them they think well you know how can just changing where I'm moving you know from my elbow but it always does because it means there's less restriction and so our movement is freer and faster and there's more, more momentum so um you know that's just a bit of the background of how it came about and who the founders were and where we are now but with many many more books that have been written since her original books um i was one of the last people to train with her and that was in 2005 and it was about that point she said would you would you be interested in writing the book for violinists so that's how I got into that, and that took four or five years to get all that down on paper. But there are there's a whole series of books now in what we call the WEEM series, so the What Every Musician series, and mine is WEB, What Every Violinist. Yeah, I, I love the book. I, I only have cracked the surface because it's such an amazing read. It's a very dense read, but I love all of the diagrams, all the photos, all the illustrations. I just... I think was it yesterday or two days ago I posted on my Instagram that I, and I had shown you the, uh, the the ligaments of the hand it was so incredibly helpful I just now I use that image this the image that you writ, had written in the book about the surgical glove a rubber mm -hmm. surgical glove and you just you just feel this expansion this elastic expansion I, and I feel like with that mental image now I, I realize I think before I was using muscle to expand my hand but if I just simply uh, allow my hand to ex to expand in the surgical club and go root back. I, for, for some reason, that prompts me to use less muscular tension, and I think that's just revelatory for me because I I personally think that tension has created problems in my playing, and I was injured as well. I don't know if I had actually mentioned that to you, but I was injured in, in, in the past. So I think this is really 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 important, and I'm dying to hear. Actually, I know you have a story to share about spiccato and your journey with spiccato, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, I can definitely share that with you. I, I'll just throw out before I go there how uh, not alone you are and, and me. I mean, I, I'm also here because of an injury that almost ended my career. Um, I took a sabbatical um, in 2000, and, let's see, when was that? Four, so right before I met Barbara. Um, and I went to study the Alexander Technique in London, France, with music Alexander Technique teachers. Um, and it really wasn't, I mean, it was fantastic. And But then it kind of culminated when I met Barbara and started working with this information because there wasn't an Alexander teacher who lived here in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, at that time, I, I really needed this information to make me independent so that I could go looking at the anatomy and really remap myself and find these new movement patterns. That was really important for me because I did not have a teacher living where I you know, was moving back to. But what I started to say was... It, I mean, a lot of research, recent research is showing between 80 and like 90% of all professional musicians are having some kind of pain or injury that they're dealing with or have had in the past. Yeah. It's, it's just unbelievable what the number, and you know, and, and it's been taboo for so long to talk yeah. about it. I and agree. Afraid of I totally losing agree. work. Yeah. So we're really trying to break that down and just make it absolutely mainstream. This is, we've got to protect ourselves. We've got to protect our students. We've got to prevent it, you know, and address it when it's already there. I totally um, agree. I totally agree. I think this is, I mean, you're the only, you're the only person I would trust right now to really educate me. I mean, I love Alexander Technique and I've done some Alexander Technique training. However, I find body mapping for me, I'm a, I need the visuals. I need the description of the bones and the ligaments and the muscles. I find that has unlocked so much more for me. In fact, I, would you be able to tell us the distinction between Alexander technique, which I think is a bit more popular and more established and body yeah. mapping? Yes, absolutely. And yeah, that's a great question. Um, particularly because it kind of grew out of, you know, the minds of two Alexander technique teachers. Um, they were always very practical they always did approach Alexander technique in a very practical way. And there are so many approaches. I mean, every personality that teaches it has a different way of you know, expressing it. Mm -hmm. And we have Alexander to thank for, you know, the, I mean, really the so much of the information that we use in body mapping is informed from his work. So um, it's just that she really felt that people needed independence. And she noticed, and I noticed when I was on my AT sabbatical, um, 
how much like it felt great after you'd had your lesson. It felt great while you were on the Alexander Technique table. And some of the teachers, you know, would give you just fantastic information too, but you'd go back to the practice room with your instrument and go, oh, I still don't know how to get there. So Alexander relied a lot on, um, he called them like cues or orders, verbal orders that you give yourself, like let the neck be free. Right. But they had to go forward and up for the spine to lengthen and widen. And, you know, that is still at the root of every, of the, you know, much of what we're teaching in body mapping. All that stuff is wonderful and true. I think Barbara just found a way in that was very practical and as you said, very visual. Mm -hmm. And because of that visual element, a lot of people to become independent and not reliant on spending, you know, a decade in Alexander Technique lessons before they could really figure out how to make it happen on their instrument right. um, for them, find that freedom. So we use, um, you know, I've always already demonstrated a little bit, but we use a lot of, um, of bony models and AT teachers do as well. I know a lot of people who are using that now in their Alexander teaching. Um, but we, you know, we kind of, we have a lot of images like we all have a whole image bank that our organization has created just to teach with. Um, so when I go and teach somewhere, I, it's generally, and probably later in our chat today, we'll I'll show you some of these slides, but we use a lot of visual slides, a lot of anatomical images. And then the next step is always to ask a lot of questions. So instead of telling them, you know, what we see all the time, sometimes we have to give that feedback, but a lot of times we want to say, uh, you know, where is it you think that movement is coming from? And that helps the student uncover their own misconception about their body. And that goes a long way to getting them motivated to work more because they realize, oh my gosh, if I didn't know where my elbow was, then, you know, what else don't I know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. and they get kind of excited about learning more. Otherwise, it just seems like an anatomy lesson, and we don't want that. I, I find anatomy boring if it isn't connected to how it's going to make me feel better <laughs> or make me sound better. You know, I, I've never had a particular interest in And yet I'm fascinated with this because it makes such a difference for people in how they feel in their body. So, for instance, the other day I had another interesting elbow mismapping. I had a violin uh, violin so I've been working with, um, and he mentioned that the uh, in his bow arm that the um, muscle uh, that he's sees on the top of his forearm would had always bothered him a little bit it didn't feel that bad but he noticed it really bulking up and getting way bigger than he'd noticed on other people and was asking about it like you know what's causing that so I watched him play for a few minutes and it was so clear like the first question that popped into my head was oh my gosh I got to ask him where he thinks that ending movement is coming from. And sure enough, as soon as I asked him, he was pointing to up here. And I said, well, it is the elbow joint, but that, that is, you know, you've got two forearm bones in your uh, forearm. The one on this side is not the one that's going to make that bending movement happen for you. It's the one that's going to take your hand from palm up to palm down. Right. And the real bending joint is way down here under underneath. And so, that was a real switch for him to have to actually flip that around to the other side. But as soon as he did, that muscle started calming down and softening. So there's another example of, I mean, we work with every joint in the body, not to, I've used two elbow examples, but uh, that's a really, that's an example of how we use questions to uncover it. So that's one I ask a lot is where does it seem like that movement is coming from for you? Um, and almost always there, there will be some, something in their answer that will lead us to, the fantasy that they have. About the fantasy it. joint or the fantasy muscles and, okay. Yeah. You know what I would love to do is maybe we could, um, maybe you could take us through some um, anatomical images and maybe take us through an exercise. But first, let me scan to see if we have any specific questions from readers and I'll sure. take a chance Absolutely. to pick an opportunity to say hello to everybody. Okay, who is here live? Mariam, hi, Mariam. Oh, hi, Sydney. Meg Lamb, hello, Meg. Hi, Valerie. Valerie's back again. Nice to see you. Let's see. Debbie. Hi, Debbie. A violist here to learn to stay away from pain and injury. Oh, thank goodness. You, yes, me too. Hi, Catherine Paul Vest. Uh, yes. Hi, Catherine L. from Claremont, Florida. Hi. Let's see. Erica. Hi, Eric Burns. Violinist here recovering from a chronic shoulder slash arm injury and excited to learn more about playing with less pain and tension. Yes, I think we all are. Hi, Darlene. Hi, Darlene. Sweetheart. They're from uh, Wisconsin, I believe. Let's see what else we have. Okay, Catherine, you were notified by Viola Gators online. Yes, Viola and Viola Gators. Hi. 
Uh, I've also been doing the Viola Tutti warm-ups. Last weekend was the Karen Tuttle coordination class online. Yes, so I think someone had posted about this interview in that group. Gina's here. Hi, Gina. Oh, Lisa's here too. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Neil. Uh, greetings from California. Yes. Hi, Lydia. Okay, do we have any specific questions for Jennifer today? And actually, I'm really curious if you have experienced an injury in your musical career, give a thumbs up or some kind of sign in the comments. Let us know. Yes, I've had an injury or thumbs up on the video. Let us know what you have uh, experienced, if you have experienced injury. That will give us an idea of how many of us have been struggling. And right now I see there's 23 of us online live. Okay, so I have burning questions. I'm wondering, hmm. Oh, we do have a question from Julia. Hi, Julia. Would love to get back to that spiccato question. You know what? I was going to ask you that question. How did you how did you improve your spiccato when you studied? Because I know you had mentioned it in the Bulletproof Musician podcast. And I remember listening to you say, oh, we don't have the visuals. But now we do. We have you we on have the visuals. Now. That's right. Me. Like Now I'm dying to know. Because I, I was listening to the, you were talking on the podcast. And I thought, Okay, I think I can imagine what she's talking about, risk about thumb. The, you were talking about the thumb, I believe. Yeah, thumb is essential. And it's it's the same kind of, uh, it's the same mapping that will help free up vibrato on the left side. So let's see if um, I can successfully do a share uh, screen with you here, let's, if this okay. works. Um, I'm ready. We are going to go. Oh, hi, Jakob. Jakob is here. <laughs> Oh, we've got some good questions coming in after you're ready for this. Oh, good. Excellent. So let's see if everybody can see that image of a hand with yeah. a thumb. Yeah, is it there? Okay, terrific. So um, if I asked all of you who are watching to point to the bottom of your thumb, I'm going to wager that many of you would point here. Uh, can you still see me, by the way, Lynn? Yes, I can. Okay. Great. Just wanted to make sure everybody could see where I was pointing. That a lot of you would point to where the skin uh, meets the rest of the hand, which would be, if you're looking on the image now, my cursor, it would be here. But with this kind of x-ray vision, what we can see is that that is by no means the end of your thumb. The thumb actually has three bones in it. One, two, three. And that is where the thumb actually begins. And if your spiccato isn't working, I would almost guarantee that one of the problems anyway is that there is chronic holding in the muscle between the index hand bone and the thumb hand bone because of this mismapping, because people have been feeling that somehow the thumb, I guess the thumb begins here and so that muscle gets chronically held. And by the way, I should mention that these mismappings, they might sound ridiculous, but it's uh, they're not conscious. It really is something that's going on subconsciously that your body just responds to your nervous system. But we can unconsciously change it by getting the anatomical truth about your design. So uh, what we're going to try in a second is have everybody actually find that joint on themselves way down here and move that thumb from where it joins your wrist bones. This little bone that you see my cursor on is a wrist bone. And this is a thumb bone that sits on the wrist bone. So we need to be able to find that freedom so that eventually both of our hands are so freed up in that, that those muscles between the two bones that the thumb hangs at neutral and it looks something like that instead of being pulled into the side of your hand. If your hand looks like this, you know you have this mismatch. And that's an example of muscles tightening in order to make it seem like bones are meeting in a place that you believe them to, but in fact, they meet somewhere else. So um, I'm gonna show you one more image and then I'm gonna stop sharing and, and, and just demonstrate with a bow. Okay. Um, so that's really important that we know where that movement is coming from and you're, I mean, every time you reach for even you know a glass of water, I used to pick up a glass of water and it looks like that, with that squeezing and the thumb pulling in. And now it look, it's a very, I've really consciously made it a very wide thing. It's gonna be the same thing on the left side, holding the instrument, which I think the next image will show us here with hyphas, that when that is really free down there, you could, I often take a pen on students and I draw a big V. So I'm yeah. coming down 
the We've side done this of that. <laughs> That's right. We did that with you. And then up the other side of the thumb. And so finding that kind of freedom and length of released muscle on both hands is really important for facility on the left side. And well, it's facility we're talking about over here for spiccato as well. It's freedom. So that's the first part of freeing up a, a, a tight or uneven spiccato. If you've always felt like your spiccato is a little unreliable, it's going to be because there's unnecessary holding going on. And that's the first culprit that we deal with. We try to make sure that that's free um, because we want it to be opposable. We've all heard that we have opposable thumbs, but if you think about the root of that word, what it means is, is that the thumb hangs opposite to the fingertips, not beside it as if it was a fifth finger, because it isn't. It's a completely different functioning digit on the hand. So we want it to be opposite the fingers. Um, see, there's a picture of wrist I'll show you because, of course, the wrist comes into it heavily. So a wrist is comprised of eight little bones, roughly in two rows. And there's that final thumb bone we were just talking about sitting on its wrist bone. So I think that's probably all I need to show you right now by way of images. Okay. And we'll talk you through how this applies now to a bow hand. Okay. Do I need my bow? Um, you can get your bows. You can use a pen. We, just, we, we, we want something that you're going to form a bow hand on. Okay. All right, so who's got a bow out there? Let's follow along. <laughs> I'm going to use a pen for now just so that it's a little easier to maneuver in the camera. Okay. Uh, many of us, I know not, not everybody listening to this, but ma many of us were taught that there was a corner of the thumb. This is difficult to do. I'm going to turn my camera a little bit here this way. That this corner that I'm demonstrating right now is where we're supposed to make contact with the stick. Now, that that's for beginners, but you'll notice already by putting my thumb there, what has happened over on the other side of the, the hand, that my hand is now chronically uh, tensed, like that. that is not a neutral. If I take it this way, you'll see it's tilted. That is neutral, where there's no muscular work holding. Oh, I see. So this side here, this muscle yeah. here? That's right. The whole uh, from the pinky down into the forearm, this this oh, bone the pinky side is called the rather elbow. hard, actually. That's right. It makes that muscle hard too. It's that's part of the muscle that's actually cranking the hand in that direction. Okay, oh, I see. And what that reduces us to when we're doing spiccato is if, if I go back to that old way where there's a slight contraction in through here because of what I believe about my thumb. Uh, that when I, when I try to do some fast spiccato, there's already a lot of holding and restriction going on around wrist bones. And so it's it has to be kind of a manufactured flop there instead of a completely free released flop. So if we all go to a neutral relationship of bones like that, and just forget about the bone for a second and forget about a bow, and then turn the hand over and just let it flop. If we are, if we remain in kind of a, a, a more supinated place, let's call it supination. Now, I think of it as rotations of the forearm, but I know violin speak, speaks about supination and pronation. So if we are too supinated, and you will be if you've got that mismapping of the thumb and you're, and you're tilting out a little bit, because it's very, very difficult to rotate if you're doing that, then you're kind of reduced to a movement that is more of a side to side wrist movement, which this, the bones can do a little bit. There's side to side movement there. But not nearly as much as there is in that direction. If we just turn it a little bit, we get a really free movement this way, and we can maintain the neutral relationship of the bones here. So um, let's just actually measure that the difference between those um, two ways of bending at a wrist. Everybody just try that with me. So take do a side to side first. Get myself centered in my camera. Okay, and now measure it by putting your other hand up and put your, your index finger like that. And notice that how, just kind of visually measure how many you know inches or centimeters you can go away from your index finger. If you keep your left hand completely still and just make that moving happen. And you can go just, just a little bit in the other direction, not very far in that direction, Oops, a little bit. Now, Turn your hand all the way. Of course, we, we're not going to play with that much pronation, but just for the teaching point, turn your hand all the way so that the palm is facing your camera. 
and take your hand that way and notice how far the wrist goes. Wow. And the one part can go in this direction as well. Oh my gosh, it's it's mind-blowingly farther. Yeah, it's inches and inches of more free movement that you can get with less effort. That's true. And that's part, partly because the wrist also has three joints. It is not just this crease in our skin. Our wrist bones come all the way up into the heel of the palm. Heel of the palm. And these are wrist bones here. So we have a joint between the hand bones and the wrist bones. We have another joint between two rows of wrist bones and then another joint between wrist bones and the forearm bones. Wow. So that when we're moving in that direction, we are afforded a huge amount of range of motion. And also if we just now flop from there, blah, blah, completely passive shaking, it's, it just, there's, there's no strain. Whereas if I try to flop it that way, there's, there, you can feel things kind of bunching and crunching a bit into each other. It's hard, you know, this is just a really easy flop. So these two remappings are essential that you do them together because if you don't remap the neutral shape here and you don't map a thumb as being capable of covering, sometimes I tell students that we want the this entire half moon curve of the top of the thumb to be available to us to travel across that uh, as we're bowing. So in, in for instance, if I'm at the frog and notice I have this neutral relationship here. So there's no extra muscular holding. That's just, you know, if I let my hand just go flop on, on top of my forearm bone, that's where it's gonna sit. It's not gonna be tilted off to one side or the other. That's just neutral. So we start from places of neutral, which is this general alignment here. If I'm at the frog, I'm gonna, my thumb is gonna be way more on the opposite corner, like actually tugging into that little bump on the bow. I'll do this with the bow now. If anybody out there knows the official name of that black bump, I would be so love to hear if there's a name for that because I use it. Yes. <laughs> and I always think they're calling it the black bump. Yes, what is anyone, it? Please, and I said, please, anyone out in the comments, type what you know of the name of this bumpy part of the frog. Is it the, the frog mouth, the lip, the. What is this? No, no. I mean, I'm like, there's the hollow there, but I'm particularly interested in that, just the, the end of the black part there, because it's a wonderful little perch for the thumb okay. to kind of get some purchase on. Okay, just so simply I'm, by I'm pushing against that bump in the frog. Yeah, on a down bow, you can release so much muscular work in the hand and the arm simply by kind of catching the side of the thumb on that. But it does require us to be willing to go onto that side as well as the side that I was originally taught had to be your contact point. So it means that we can just kind of throw away this idea that there's one place that the tip of the thumb should always be and allow this kind of traveling to happen as we bow. So See, if my wrist is moving freely, yeah, from side to side, then the thumb ends up having a whole range of places. And when I'm at the, the tip, it's definitely gonna be more on the other corner of the thumb. Get myself so centered again. At the tip, it would be the, the, the traditional, shall I say, <laughs> the traditional right. side of the thumb. Okay, for me, I can actually see the right side of my thumbnail kind of wearing with a callus and down. I won't show this on right. camera. That's not really pleasant, but I can. <laughs> but yeah, I'm allowed to be there. Am I? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. You're, and in fact, this is a general rule in body mapping is you're allowed to go anywhere the body can go. Just don't get stuck there. Because if I you're stuck it. there. I would like to reiterate this because this was one of the mind blowing bits of information that I got from my private lesson with you. We were working on the pinky and uh, this was, I think it unlocked so many doors when you told me that the thumb on the left side could, could actually, it was, it was allowed to go different places. And if you want to know um, more about that, everybody, if you just go to my YouTube channel and I have a tutorial on the pinky where I'm quoting Jennifer and her book and what I directly learned from her. So if you want more about this, go to my video on pinky because it was mind blowing. Okay. Anyway, I love this principle. Yeah. Of, um, you're allowed to go, but as long as you are fluid and, and you know where to go back, I just love that because then we're no longer frozen on one right. side of the phone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And there are places of neutral in, in body map. We talk about places of balance or places of neutral. And that the example we've already talked about is this one, that that is where there is the least amount of muscular work happening. The bones are just resting on each other and it's gravity just kind of taking the bones. You know, my hand bones are sitting vertically on the wrist bones. The wrist bones are sitting on the radial bone. And that's a place of balance 
and it's it can be even home base that we come back to, but when we're going to move through that place of balance with every stroke we make, but that, you know, as that thumb is allowed, if I take my fingers off, you can see that that's what the down bow is going to look like. It's going to be pulling that way. Okay. And then as my wrist comes up for the up bow, my thumb is allowed to travel that way. Okay. So if I was to just actually slide it all across the stick, you, you stick, you could all try that. It's, it's just that really fluid uh, changing. And I put my fingers on and, and I have a fluid wrist because I'm not trying to do what I used to do, which was, I was a kind of a very Balamian, you know, believer. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong about anybody's technique, by the way, but I was really trying to make this be what it always looked like. And so I was hanging on and the thumb never left that, that point, that corner of my nail. And it was really tight. And boy, oh boy, trying to find, you know, loose finger and wrist movement from that was at best, you know, I worked hard, really hard at it. And I got kind of good at it, doing it that way in order to, you know, do what I needed to do in my stroke that job. But it never felt easy and it didn't look graceful. And it sounded way better as soon as I started figuring out that that had to travel and that I could rotate a little bit more in order to allow the wrist to travel in that plane rather than in that plane. So, so could I ask, is there, do you recommend that we start, let's say, uh, dedicate a certain amount of minutes, like at least five minutes a day, to the, maybe at the beginning of our practice session, on, so it's like an easy open string detache exploring this? Is, is that what you would recommend? If you are trying to remap, uh, the first thing I would do is, is, is probably spend a solid week, of, you know, not trying it on the violin and just oh. getting used to how you're going to organize that arm when you pick things up, how you're going to get that thumb three jointed it just in order to get that, you know, kind of already get a head start on it away from the instrument. Um, because it's a lot of brain work initially to just to get the body changing in that direction. So it might be a little frustrating to immediately take it into practice. I don't know. Uh, I liked just really making sure that I was picking things up with a thumb that was moving from down there. Well, okay. So the first thing that we're going to practice is just getting it, the brain body connection, mind body connection between this new newly found or, or newly acknowledged base joint of the thumb. Oh, right? That's right. Okay. Exactly. And the joint on there. Yeah. And you will notice the other thing that happens with people who have been chronically right here and have been um, mapped as, as two joint, which is, you know, when the hand cocks off that way and this is pulling in this thin our eminence here, that's it's called, it's, we'll just call it the thumb muscle on the palm gets really overdeveloped yeah. and quite big and quite hard. <laughs> And my, my left hand had, I mean, I was mismapped in both of these ways. I think I successfully got out of the right hand first, and it was one of the quicker mismappings I've done. It was only a matter of a few weeks, whereas some of the bigger torso stuff has taken, you know, over a year for certain things to really settle. But on the on the thumb side, on the left-hand side, too, um, I mean, I, I couldn't get through a buck fugue because there was there were a few measures where I started, you know, really pulling in there, and I had to remap that whole section of the buck fugue where, just I, I just sat without the bow for a couple of weeks, just plucking those those you know problematic chords that were making me tense there, and just retraining what it could be like to soften. So you you want to feel you'll feel this part getting smaller as you continue to remap as you pick up your knife and fork and your pen and your glass of water differently. And, and when, I, when you were doing your spiccato, you can really uh, find my right angle on the camera here. You can really be looking down at this part. That's that is also part of that tightening and just ask for softness. Just go soften, let go, release. It's one example of a place in the body that has chronic tension, but frequently we don't feel it there. It might end up causing us tendonitis in the forearm, and we'll never know that there was actually a connection here because this never hurt. I but see. it's a real problem. I see. I bet you we have lots of questions to go through. Let me, this is amazing. Guys, I mean, everybody, was that not incredible? Like, please give right now a thumbs up, a heart for that incredible lesson. I, the, I've i always wanted to know this, Jennifer. Thank you for explaining that. Please, please, please give a heart right now for Jennifer to, to <laughs> thank her for that, because I'm so thrilled to hear that. Okay, so let's just review back here. Um, Oh, boy, tons. Uh, okay, so Sydney has a small viola, small viola hands and stiff neck. Lisa, are there particular exercises you can do to learn to use the side muscles instead of the shoulder? Someone here has elbow tendonitis. 
uh, she developed a stretch which uh, eliminated very quickly. That's Debbie. Um, Julia has tends to get a big knot behind her left shoulder blade. Monica is saying hi from Langley, BC. Hello, West Coast. I had a <laughs> bicep shoulder last year, which took me over six months to recover. I am most interested in hearing about anything to do with the bow arm to stay as relaxed as possible, especially in the area of spiccato bowing. Well, I think we covered a lot of that. Uh, Mariam from Morocco. Hi, Mariam. Wonderful explanation. I actually had tendonitis in my wrist and my doctor suggested a few, a rest of a few months. But even after resting for several months, as soon as I play, it comes back. Yeah. Until one day when I noticed that I always elevate my left shoulder. Yeah, I've done that. And have it contract contracted during all my playing because my shoulder rest was inappropriate for me. Oh, I'd love to ask you about this one too. So it seems that when I remind myself to relax the shoulder, I don't have any pain in my wrist. So I was wondering, can a tense shoulder be, re oh, and then it cuts off. Oh boy. Um, Oh gosh, so many questions, Jennifer. How are we going to get through them all? Uh, okay, Erica well, asked any suggestions how to teach this info to young students. Okay, you're going to have to choose which question you want to answer. I think because uh, upper string players, have all, there's a, so much in the pedagogy that misleads us about the upper arm structure, what, what we're calling shoulder, it might be really good to, to go there and just do that explanation. And, you know, I encourage all of you um, watching to you know, get some of the reading material and, and cause this is just a stepping off point for you. I, you know, I can give you a few tips and uh, uncover a few mismappings, but definitely go and start reading. And because a lot of this you can do on your own, you don't have to pay a lot of money to somebody. Um, I'm of course happy to see people if you, if you want to contact me and have, you know, some Skype lessons, but let's talk about the, the upper arm structure. Um, because there's just, there are a lot of fallacies about what should be happening. Uh, in our shoulder region. So let's get this screen sharing going. Oh, another screen, screen sharing. Oh, yeah. we have another request for shoulder rest talk. Yes, from Julia. Hi, okay. Julia. Well, that, that's going to enter into this discussion uh, about the awesome. shoulder. So let's see if we can do that all in one fell swoop. Okay. And Jane, a yeah. left shoulder blade. Wow. You're a popular uh, popular resource today, Jennifer. <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad. That's what I'm supposed to be here for. Yes. So, uh, Lynn, just tell me, are you able to see that slide of the whole line? I am. Can everyone see that? Thumbs up if you can see that, everybody. Yeah, is that clear? I hope everyone can see. Let's see. I can see it. I hope everyone can see it. Let's see. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to hope and assume. I'll use a model as well, just in case somebody isn't able to see the the image. Um, the, the main mismapping here is that, um, well, let's see, I'll start, I'll start with where it comes from, or one, one of the sources where it comes from. Um, a whole arm, in reality, includes a collarbone and a shoulder blade. And of course, upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, a wrist and a hand. But the most commonly left out part of most musicians map and especially upper string players is the collarbone and the shoulder blade. Um, and there are reasons for that. One reason is the word shoulder, uh, because if I asked you all to point to your shoulder, I bet you we would have at least five different answers. Some people are going to point to the front, probably because they've had pain there. Some people are going to go up onto the shoulder muscles where you get a massage. Uh, some people are going to go to the shoulder blade. Some people might go to the actual joint in the arm underarm region where it actually is. But it's not a good enough word in our teaching. We, because of that, everybody has a different idea of what it is. It's not an anatomical model. Uh, uh, sorry, it's not an anatomical unit of the body. It's a region. So uh, when I cup a shoulder, I have my hand on three different bones, right? It's on the humerus the collarbone and the shoulder blade. And this little lady right here is responsible for a lot of our problems. <laughs> My Barbie doll. Uh, so when she goes swimming, and you can see that, correct? Everybody can see that? When she swims, she looks very different than how we would look if we went swimming, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, because most of us learned early enough to do the front crawl stroke when we still had really beautiful collarbone and shoulder blade movement. Those two bones are a unit. 
And you can't move one without the other. Go ahead and try it. Try to put your fingers on your collarbone and wiggle your shoulder blade. And you'll feel that there's just no way that you could do that without the collarbone coming. If you try to keep the collarbone still but move the shoulder blade, you'll find that it's impossible. It's one unit. So uh, this is really important when it comes to learning to bow to the extreme ends of the of this, you know, the stick when we're at the tip. The whole thing needs to follow forward. When we go to the frog, it has to come forward and up. And the same principles are true on the left side, but it's a little trickier because it's covered by a violin and we can't see it. And so it tends to disappear completely out of our awareness because even when we watch ourselves in a mirror, we can't see what's happening in that region. So we've got the, the, the deck is kind of loaded against us a little bit. Um, so in helping people remap uh, how to move here, I often have them try to move like Barbie. So let's use our left arms. Let's put our, our fingers on our left collarbone and um, just try doing the front crawl stroke without letting the collarbone move. And you'll feel like you won't get very far in the pool, right? You feel kind of restricted. And then okay. compare that to if you did a, a full front crawl movement in the pool, how much the collarbone and shoulder blade unit is moving underneath your fingers. So that's the very first thing that we have to remap in order to start finding freedom in these this region, which by the way was my original injury. Okay. I woke up one day in about 1994 uh, after having played a, several weeks of opera. I was sitting principal second of the symphony here and, um, and I'd been trying to hold my shoulders down because that's what we're taught. I, I would bet you a lot of you have been told either get your shoulders back or get them down or don't hunch them or don't let them move. And that's where this comes from in violin pedagogy. And yes, we don't want our students coming to the frog and hunching up like that. That's not what I'm advocating, but I am advocating that you teach them to let it move in the right order. And that's what I want to tell you next, that there, there's a particular um, sequence of movement that if you watch babies moving, it's exactly how they move. And the fancy word for it is called humero, which is this bone, scapular, which is the shoulder blade, humeroscapular rhythm. And so let me, let, I'll just uh, give you a few, few bits more of information before we um, give a demonstration of that. So here is what in body mapping we call arm joint number one. That is where it, the whole arm meets the torso. This joint over here is an arm bone meeting another arm bone. If I pull up my model, you'll see what I mean, that this meets, so that's the ball and there's the socket, but the socket is the shoulder blade. And if we try to move this part of our arm, the ball, without letting the socket come with the ball, then we're actually putting a lot of strain and eventually it can actually dislocate. I've seen it in people who are very loose ligamented here. If they're trying to hold the shoulders back and down and trying to get to the frog with the bow, the ball just pops out. And that's very painful. Then you have to go to the hospital and have it, you know, relocated for you. So that's an extreme version of it. My version of it was uh, that one of the muscles atrophied that is supposed to help the shoulder blade mood. I just stopped using it for years. I see. Because I was trying to hold my shoulders down. What, would that have been the ro rotate one of the rotator cuff muscles? Nope, it was the serratus anterior. It Absolutely. lives, uh, I'll be able to show you a picture of it in a minute, but it lives way up here. On, like it comes down several ribs, I think nine ribs it covers, and it attaches on the underbelly, like this part in here of the shoulder blade. Oh, it's deep inside. It, yeah, it's the, one of the deep, it is probably the deepest okay. uh, arm support and moving muscle that we have. And because I was trying to, you know, use a lot of muscular effort on the superficial layer of muscles to hold my shoulders back and down, uh, it just gave up the ghost. So what I started to say was one morning I woke up after playing all that opera, being on the G-string at the frog, right? Second oh. violin. And trying to hold the shoulder down, but trying to, get, trying to stay over there for hours at a time. And that's when the serratus just, it just let go. And uh, it took me over a year of physical therapy to even, you know, really be able to play easily again wow and it still was never right until i met barbara and started remapping what i'm about to share with you which is humeroscapular rhythm okay so that that's um you know this that that is just really essential to know for upper string players that the ball meets the socket but the socket is the shoulder blade which means that the socket i.e shoulder blade has got to move 
Right. You cannot try to hold that down. So that's arm joint number one. We've talked a little bit about both of those joints now. Um, here's some other pictures of it. That's a side view of the ball meeting the socket. If everybody wants to find where your socket is, just um, reach around your torso, find the shoulder blade on the other side and wiggle it around. And then walk your fingers up the side of that shoulder blade once you've found it. And keep walking, walking, walking until you're in the back rim of the armpit region. And you'll feel probably quite a tender spot. You'll feel where my red X is here on the image, exactly where the, that, that is the socket, that part of the shoulder blade. So it's not there. It might be where your T-shirt seam joins your the rest of the shirt. Anyway, that is, that's called palpating. That's when we use our fingers to really get x-ray vision about our own body and know where these different parts are. <laughs> to all the people listening right now, who has never been this intimate with your armpit before? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, we can even get more intimate. <laughs> I've never been this intimate with my armpit ever. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to actually feel the head of the ball, all you need to do is lift the arm up. Okay. And, and put your fingers right where you put your deodorant on. Okay. And that the ball, you'll be able to feel the ball. Oh. Right in here. Oh boy. Yeah. It, it's a little bit tender if I push too hard. Yeah. Yeah. There are muscles that live around there that uh, you don't want to be too rough, but you know, when the arm goes up, it pivots up out of the socket. And then oh. when the arm comes back, it pivots back into it again. Oh, That's I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. I think I feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I know where to put you in right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> So humorous gap of the rhythm is in order to prevent our students or ourselves from hunching, which is what leads teachers to say, get your shoulders down. Um, we need to understand that there's the sequence. So the humerus always moves first when it's healthy movement and the scapula follows. I wouldn't say entirely passively, but way more passively than like the people who are trying to initiate movement from here. We don't want that. That's, that's like in my train analogy, that's like the caboose pushing the train. So, so we don't, we we don't, don't want, that. want this to initiate movement, the collarbone. We want the, the humerus, the arm bone to lead. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. exactly. Okay. So if it leads in our movement, whatever it is on, on the bow side, it's tip to frog. On the left side, it's shifting up into a high position. You definitely want to see movement coming from that collarbone there, but just watch once. I, I'm going to lead from the back of my elbow, which is the humerus at the okay. other end. So I think about leading there, and the whole socket follows around the side of the ribs, and you have a humeroscapular rhythm. Now, that's we can refine it. Sometimes people are still using wrong sets of muscles, but that's your basic principle. Holding it down is like pulling the caboose in the opposite direction from the train. And we don't want that, but we also don't want hunching, which is the caboose pushing from behind. So let's just look at two examples of it. Um, oh, I'll mention this because I bet you there may have been somebody in this group who's had numbness and tingling in the hands. So if you've been told to hold your shoulders down, what's going to happen is you're going to have chronically cold hands, which is mm -hmm. quite common. Mm -hmm. And at its worst, you'll have numbness and tingling in the hands because the nerve, yeah. which is here, the white stuff, so the black stuff are your, your blood vessels, and that's going to get impinged by pulling that collarbone down on top because they run between the top rib and the collarbone. Right. So, so those nerves, it's like pushing the garden hose down. Yeah. Locking that's right. Down. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so people end up getting pins and needles in their hands and fingers because of what's going on up here. Medically, it's called thoracic outlet syndrome. If anybody's had it, you may have been diagnosed with it. And the best solution is just to figure out how to have a really nice neutral arm structure. Remember, we talked about neutral here. There's a neutral here as well, and it's not down here with sloping shoulders. Okay. It's And uh, I highly recommend once um, we're able to all get to our local hardware store easily, that you go buy pipe insulation. I'll show this once I stop sharing the screen because you'll see it easier. But... These things are amazing for finding that neutral for neutral. the arm stroke. So we'll come back to that moment in, in just a moment. Anyway, that's why pulling down on them is actually way worse than the hunching. This isn't great because there is going to be extra muscular tension here, but here we have muscular tension and 
the possibility of nerve damage and uh, chronic right, cold. Right, because this is pushing down on those nerves inside. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the nerves get compressed and the blood vessels get compressed and our hands end up being the ones who suffer because all of those nerves and blood vessels run down the arm into the hand. So may I just quickly ask, because I think there's so many flying questions and I apologize everybody. They, like Jennifer is giving us incredible depth of information. And I'm, I'm sorry if we're not gonna get to specific points of your question, but what Jennifer is teaching us is so, I think, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, but what you're showing us is basically the root of all the issues that you're that all the questions are asking about shoulder rest, tingling, um, numbness, golfers, yeah. elbow, left shoulder blade area. This is all related to what you're showing us right now, right? It is all, most of what you just listed there is directly related. The the golfer's elbow thing is indirectly related, but yes, you, you're not going to get past it very well unless you take care of the larger structure first. Okay, so, so this is per pertinent to all your questions out there, all of this structural talk that you're giving us now. Yeah. And I want to be so, of your time. Um, I mean, this is getting on uh, to an hour. I don't want to steal any more of your time that you have budgeted for. How much... Well, uh, I mean, I'm, I can go on for another five, ten minutes if, if other people can, and if they can't, obviously they'll they'll need to leave. I mean, um, I don't hear you forever, but I don't want to steal your time either. That's that's fine. I, I mean, I've done this uh, a few times where you know there were so many questions we, we just wanted to stay and, and answer some of them. Um, so I'll just briefly say something about shoulder rest to finish off that idea of what's going on on the left side with this. So your number one. Uh, remapping that you need to do is to make sure that you have a collarbone that is not being pushed down by the weight of the head and the violin on top of it because that's what's going to happen you're going to end up with problems in your hand okay. um chin rest almost no chin rests on the market are high enough and I, this is a five foot one person speaking I'm so imagine if you're, yeah right and if you're if you're six foot uh imagine you know if you're trying to use a, a just a chin rest off the shelf it's too low, and so then people end up having to reach down and you're using way too much uh, muscular work in your neck because now your head is not being supported by an upright spine. The spine is leaning and, and that 10 pound head, it's a very heavy head, is uh, having to be gripped by the neck muscles. Oh, so so um, a custom H and rest is a wonderful thing. This one is by the company named Frisch and Denig. They're in the States, um, they're fitters, a lot of them in the state, but uh, I know we have uh, somebody in Montreal who also does some custom made ones. Now, Jennifer, will you send me that link so I can share that with the people watching? I'll add that. I'll, I'll add that in the description box. Um, if you yeah. watch the replay later, I'll I'll add that later. Yeah, you bet. I'll, I'll I'll give you some information about that company and also the fitter that I use most that helps people, you know, figure out the shape of your jaw. So I know the question was about shoulder rest, and I'm talking about chin rest, but the reason is that a chin rest is a hundred times more important that you've got that fitted to the right height and the right shape for your jaw than what's on than what you're than trying to build up height here. I see. notice that you know I'm a short person, so I can get away with a very small sponge. And and the fitter that I'm going to give you recommend will also help you figure out what you should be using on the other side. But the mm. principle that you have to stick with here is that the place of support for an instrument is on the collarbone, not on the front of the shoulder. If you are primarily looking for support coming from this region, you're on muscles, you're on pectoral muscles, they are going to tighten against the pressure of that. You, you've, got, you've got this rest coming in and you're gonna be pushing into it and trying to meet it. I'm not saying that shoulder rests are bad or wrong. You can learn how to play freely with them. But I'm saying that if you don't do that remapping first to get the instrument resting primarily, what I sometimes say is bone on wood and wood on bone. Okay, so that's a general principle, right? Wood on the bone, bone. Yeah, that makes that's sense. Finding that collarbone shelf. That's right. So that is, you know, and if I'm way up high in position, I'm going to drop another pound of head, and I'm going to nod from up on the top of the spine. I'm not going to jut it forward from my vertebrae. I nod a bit of extra weight for my security. I shift down and then I release. Now I might only have half a pound of head on there. So that so, of the weight of the skull is just temporary for us to shift back down to a first position. Temporary. Yeah. Okay. And if you're a joy struck play, I mean, that head is moving all the time. It's going into different places. Sometimes he's down here. Sometimes it's off. 
So that again goes back to our principle of never being in a position. You 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 go where the body can go, and you but you just have to know when the appropriate moment is. When can you when you need extra support? When you don't. So another movable feast. Uh, and so then the freedom for from here, whatever you decide to use on the on the back of the instrument, you need to be able to make sure that you're not rolling that left side. Sorry, this, the, the camera is making me a little backwards here because it's opposite. But if we're if we're doing any movement like that in, or, in order to move into a shoulder um, rest or even into the back of the violin, if we're hauling the shoulder blade up the surface of the back in that direction, that's when you really start getting fatigued in through shoulder region muscles and you're jamming stuff in the shoulder joint so you could feel pain in there as well. Is that, I think someone had asked a question about the have developing a huge ball of knots in that left side. I forget who it is. I'm so sorry. Who, uh, there's so many questions. I know one of you has asked that. Left shoulder blade area. Yeah, I, I have that. Is that the reason why that we're hauling up, as we said, the shoulder blade too far up? Okay. Yeah, very likely. I mean, without seeing them, I'm not going to say for sure, but it's the most okay. common cause of tension through uh, under the shoulder blade and in between the spine and the shoulder blade and in the trapezius muscles up here is that that shoulder region isn't being allowed to be at neutral and, and then move with humor after the rhythm. So it's going to move when I shift up the, the surface of the front of my shoulder region will come into the back of the instrument because it's following this bone, but it's not going to stay touching the back of the instrument. When I shift back to first position, it falls away and I can slide my hand right in there because that is not where I'm supporting it from. I'm supporting it between here. And if it's sitting on the collarbone, we have to remember that the collarbone moves as a part of your arm. Okay. So this, this is not being pushed down into a place of immobility. It has to be free to follow the rest of your arm and, and move freely wherever you go around the violin. So, Simple principle. It's going to be free to move. Wow. Oh my goodness. Wow. This. Wow. We've hit an hour, and I. Uh, I think we could talk for hours. I mean, okay, everybody. Wasn't this not the most amazing lesson workshop? I mean, I think we all need to give you a huge, huge, huge thank you. Um, oh, I'm thrilled. I'm really grateful that you asked me, Lynn. I'm really happy to. Incredibly it. generous of you to share all of this. I mean, normally we'd have to sign up for one of your workshops online or in person, and you just gave so much information for us, and it's been very, very generous of you. Thank you. And um, could everyone please give a huge heart of appreciation for Jennifer? I mean, this is rare information, and I, I feel like not we don't get this information when I have not encountered anyone like you and how many decades have I been playing the violin and you're giving this information to us now. And I'm just so incredibly thankful. And I I'm so excited for my boot campers because they're going to get this from you. We're going to have a lot longer to work on this. I'm just so yeah. incredibly excited. Yes. Look at all the thank yous coming in Jennifer. We have thank yous from all over the place. Oh, that's Thank nice. You, from Erica and Jamira. Hi, Andrew. Dr. Ro Dr. Rose is here. Fantastic session. Oh, my <laughs> yes, Valerie, thank you. You're welcome. Julia, this was so fantastic. Thank you for your generosity. Look at all this. Oh, my goodness. From Julia, Debbie, Catherine, Monica. Wow. Okay, you're 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 just incredible, Jennifer. Like you're, you're a rock star. Um, oh, I feel like you're well, the local, local Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> that's very sweet. It's, I mean, it comes from being injured and having my heart broken that I thought I might lose my career, right? I mean, that's our worst fear. And I'm just so, so happy that, you know, not only was I able to overcome it, but that it, we can help other people now. I, I'm incredibly inspired by that because I, I know what it's like to be injured. I thought for a while that I wasn't able to recover from my own injury. It, it didn't sound nearly as drastic as yours, but I did have to take time off playing and I tried to return to playing too soon. And it just mm -hmm. devastated me every single time that I couldn't play. So I, that's why I feel this is incredibly important, especially for people who are now are suffering and struggling and hitting a wall. Um, Jennifer, you're amazing. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. And I will look forward to our session inside of our boot camp. And for those who are listening, can you please tell us what's coming down the pipeline for you? Because I want everyone to follow your work. I want to spread the word about all your books and your teachings to everybody, because I think it's so pertinent. How can we follow you and what do you have coming up? 
Well, uh, I'm going to be teaching at the the Exhale Again, which is a group based in Switzerland for Musicians Health. That will be coming up several times in the next year. Um, the dates aren't completely set yet, but I know August and October is what they're shooting for. So keep your eyes open for that. We'll be posting on that on Facebook. Um, it's Exhale. It's called The Exhale. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of Europe's really fine musician wellness people are, are working on that. Um, I'm training some people that it might not be as pertinent for you guys, but just so you know that if anybody got, got caught by this information, I thought, wow, I'd really like to learn to teach this to other people. Uh, every summer, I almost every summer, I run the training institute. Usually it's in person here in St. John's, but I'm doing it online this year. So that's happening July 6th to 11th. And um, that's very usually, soon. Yeah, it's really soon. It was a week after next or anyway, July yeah. 6th. Uh -huh. um, and uh, certainly I'll, I'll give out the um, information. I am writing a third book and it is entirely on uh, the shoulder region, how it relates to the rest of the body, but all of the really fine details that we didn't have time to get into today. So hopefully that will be out well. I really just wrote it during COVID. Thank goodness for two week quarantine. <laughs> Give me a chance to get it all down on paper. But anyway, hopefully within the next year or so, we we'll, that will be on the bookshelf. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, for everyone, I, I think everyone's knows so I put your website uh, on the screen so everyone can now write it down and go visit. Um, yeah, so keep looking for me to plug all of Jennifer's work. <laughs> I'm going to be her biggest mouthpiece going forward here. And um, for those of you who are in my boot camp, can't wait to work with you. And Jennifer's going to be there. For those of you who are contemplating joining my boot camp, there's a link right now that you can see. You can find it in the description box. And I think we will adjourn for this beautiful Saturday. Jennifer, thank you so much. And for those thank of you watching the replay, please go ahead and share this video. I want everyone to benefit from this and have no one injured from going forward in the future. Absolutely. So. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Oh, lovely. Nice to see oh, you all. Or see you Lynn, and hear from you all. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Okay, take care. You Bye. too. Bye.